we all deserve a raise. Now, I do have to say, like, I'm not good at coming up with titles, and I was just kind of happy about this one, so I hope you got a chuckle out of it too, and I'm sure you deserve a raise as well. Um, my name is Ryan Booz. I currently work for uh, Redgate Software as a Postgres and DevOps advocate. Uh, Redgate's been in, in the tooling business for many years, uh, more than 23 now. They're based out of uh, the UK. Uh, and they've mostly been the .NET and SQL Server shop, which is how I knew about them, you'll see in just a minute. Uh, and over the last two or three years, they've been investing in things like Flyway. Uh, they acquired Flyway, which is an open source migration framework, uh, and they've been exploring other databases. And that's when I started to connect with them uh, to try and help them with their uh, Postgres and, and open source um, ventures. So that's how you can find me uh, and do some stuff within the, I'm trying to do more within the community, uh, help get things going. Now, uh, the presentations I give will eventually make it up here. This is the first time I've given this talk in total, as I said a little bit earlier. So it's not there yet, because I usually wait until I've given it at least once, see what feedback, if I need to tweak something before I post the slides and the scripts. Uh, but probably by tonight, it will be there. And I'll explain to you in just a minute how that's going to work. Uh, well, I'll tell you now. So the way I'm doing this talk today, I'm going to give it a go, is this is half slides, half live coding, as it were, live SQL. And uh, so what I've done is I've hidden the slides that have the SQL in it. But when I post it, the deck will have all of the slides with the SQL, and you can get the script as well. But that way, you could just kind of flow through as I'm doing this, what I'm doing live. Really quickly about myself, why I love dad jokes. Uh, just so you have a little bit clue about me, I am married. Uh, my wife and I have six children. Uh, the oldest is almost 18, about to go to college. <sighs> and my youngest is four, so I get lots of time with all of them. We love having a big family. Uh, if you see them in a the hallway uh, or somewhere else and you want to talk to me about something other than Postgres um, and get me just chatting for hours, family for sure. I'm a, I love music. It's a big part of my life. I'm an amateur beekeeper of six years now, and a few others in the community are beekeepers as well. I could talk about bees all day. Uh, and I actually do stream sometimes when I go out to my hives and pull them apart uh, on YouTube. So if you look up Ryan Booze, you'll see every once in a while, I will go out and pull them apart. And I started roasting coffee during the pandemic. Uh, so I love talking about coffee too. Here's what we're gonna do, hopefully. Uh, again, first time giving the talk, I either have way too much or way too little. We'll see how this goes, I've tried. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief intro into why I think this is, why this is interesting to me. I think it's a tool that a lot of people that are using Postgres don't necessarily understand in total. Uh, and I just hope that I can give you through this talk a little bit of a view into the power of arrays within Postgres because it's a unique feature set. And so we'll go through that, arrays and so forth. You'll see these slides tick by as we go, so you'll kind of get a hint where we are in the presentation. So first, the intro. Mind blown. So I show you this slide for one reason. And it's mostly because most of my career was spent right here. Right? So I have more than 15 years of experience in the SQL Server space. I did a little bit of Postgres and some open source stuff along the way in hobbies, and I did some stuff ahead of time. But the majority of my professional career until five years ago was in SQL Server. And there are definitely times where I wish I could have used something like an array to store data or process data in a function or stored procedure. And it's just not possible in SQL Server. It's not possible in MySQL. It's not possible in Oracle, right? So in, every data maybe has slight flavors, little bits here and there, but not the way that's done in Postgres. And so uh, I changed jobs. So I guess I should go back. I changed jobs. And uh, my quick story, which I've told too often, is I thought I was going to help this company with SQL Server, sign the contract, a month later, I show up at the job, and no one, no one. It's not going to help me with the 9 volt. Uh, they need a 9 volt. So any chance that the... OK. I'll talk real loud. Um, oh, thanks. I clicked it. I wiped out of it. Thanks, guys. Uh, Are we back? Are we live? OK. Um, 
And so I had to learn Postgres really quickly. And that was kind of like, oh shoot, what am I going to do? So we get into this feature. I'd been there a, a couple weeks, and we had this new feature going into the database where we were providing, uh, going to provide SSO into, uh, for our clients, federated login, right? And so the first client that signed up, it turns out that the team had designed it for one domain to one federated login. And of course, the first client that signed up said, well, we have many businesses. We've acquired businesses over the years, so many domains need to go to one parent authentication source. So again, before I knew about this, uh, the developer had done it. They were using .NET, so they were using something like this. I don't remember the tables. This is fake pseudocode. But I probably would have said, well, I have an authentication provider. It has a domain. It has some other stuff. And then if I need to have a list, I'd do a linking table, right? Say something like authentication provider domain. So for each client in each domain, here's the authentication provider. Well, uh, a junior dev had gotten this. She was newly out of college doing a great job figuring this stuff out, and she did what she would expect to do using .NET. She created a list. She didn't know any better, and it's not even better. She just didn't know what would happen. Well, this makes sense to me in .NET. NPG SQL, which is the driver for .NET, just did what it was supposed to do. She ran the migration, and she got this. I was called in not long after that to try and help because I had previous experience with authentication, I went to look at the table, and I saw this, and I said, what's going on here? I've never seen an array in a table. That was my moment of realizing, oh, there's something new here that I could figure out, and I bet there's a lot I could do with this. Um, we ended up keeping that solution. Actually, it, it ended up working well once I started to understand that Postgres supported arrays. Um, so. That was kind of my journey into this. Over the last uh, five years, I've learned more about how things work within Postgres, where arrays are used and can be used to help do data processing. And what I've really found is, uh, for fun projects, working with data to do transformation. And so what we're going to do over the next uh, 40 minutes or so is talk about how we can use some of these tools inside the database to transform the data uh, to bring value out of it. And that's just an example. So for me, it's about just opening the opportunity for you to understand what these might be if you don't have experience with it and go from there. I used it, for instance, uh, I was loving the Wordle craze a year ago. Anyone else, Wordle fans? I haven't done one in like 10 months. But for two months, I did it every single day. Um, and I thought, man, I wonder if I could ingest that the tweets, take those emojis, and somehow make it into data that I could query and do something with. Turns out I learned how, and it's kind of fun, and I'm going to show you a little bit later. Uh, I did the advent of code this year. And if you don't know what the advent of code is, it's just daily puzzles. I'm actually not done with them, but uh, daily puzzles with just random input. And you have to do something with that input to make it into something to provide, to get a, an answer or a result. And then you can move on through the day. And so all of these tools are, you know, using arrays and some of the functions with arrays are one of the tools I use. If I didn't have it, honestly, it would have been a lot harder. And so it's, it's a really fun thing to do in Postgres. So let's talk very quickly about arrays, and then we'll get to some demo. So what are arrays? I'm assuming most people here have probably dealt with an array at some point in a programming language. We'll say that they're a list of related data, uh, right? And, and they generally have the same data type. In Postgres, they have to be the same data type within the array. Uh, they, Postgres does support multi-dimensional arrays, but again, they have to be of the same data type. Uh, and I'll show you an example later. Multi-dimensional arrays also have to have the same internal lengths. So if you have a, uh, a, an array of arrays, each of the internal arrays have to be the same number of, of things. That actually, uh, I was trying to solve a puzzle for advent of code, and I thought, oh, this would be great. I'll use a multi-dimensional array. And of course, worked for an hour, went to run, and it was like, ah. Oh, I can't have different sizes of arrays in there. So they're referenced by their numerical position, all right, element one, element two, element three, so forth. And Postgres is a little bit different from other, I, I don't know what this cable is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one step back because I'm going to unplug something. I keep kicking it. Uh, it is one-based. And so if you use JavaScript and Python and others, you're used to doing zero-based uh, arrays or lists. We are one-based, uh, except for one random value somewhere, and I always forget what that is. 
Um, all right, and then what is this, where can these be used? All right, so uh, Postgres for literally many, many years has supported this as a data type for a column. Any data type provided by Postgres out of the box, most user-defined types, uh, base types, and so forth can all be stored as arrays, right? So there's, there's very little limitation on how you can use these as far as the data types go. Um, and then functions and procedures, this is actually what really opened up some possibilities for me. Uh, there were times where I needed, a, I would have a, a store procedure to do, maybe as an example, on an upgrade to our application, I would need to process something. And I'm used to using an array or a list for storing values when they're found, almost like a cache, and then looking up, if that value's been found, I can move on. Well, to be able to actually use an array in a function or store procedure, I could do that. I could say, you know, I'm iterating rows, finding a value, okay, I've already found that value. Sometimes I'd say, and it's very efficient. Can, is that, does that value exist inside this array? So being able to access the array data type in PLPG SQL is awesome. This is how you create them or, or reference them, right? So an array in Postgres when you're writing SQL, which you'll see in a few minutes, uh, is always a single quote curly bracket, and then all the values are separated by commas. The only difference, I think, is a point data type. I always forget which one it is. It is a semicolon you can define for the data type what the delimiter is in the array. In Postgres, 99% of them are comma, all right? So if you type out a string literal, you can do it this way. You can put double quotes around them. You are required to put double quotes around it if it contains a comma or a single quote, right? Because you need the single quote for the literal itself. And then you can also do the constructor, right? So you can literally say array, square bracket, and the values internally. Now, the values internally do need to match the data type, right? So if you're doing strings, you need to single quote them, otherwise it's trying to interpret it as a column name. All right, so that's how we do it. We're gonna see this in just a second. Any questions at the outset? All right, can you see that okay, even in the back? I can make it a little bit bigger, but then it's gonna to start to really crowd. I'll do one more quick one. All right, so here's the demo. It's gonna be pretty short. Uh, for this first part, we're going to create a table. You'll see that I have uh, that array data type right there. So we're just going to store, again, I only have a few minutes, so I'm not going to get too complex here. It's just going to be a table to store a film ID, a title of a film, and then an array of types. You know, is it a documentary? Is it, uh, what are some other values do I have? Is it an action film? Something like that. So maybe we could search later. So I'm using dBeaver. I'm not going to highlight stuff because it takes too long. And so when I hit control enter, whatever statement, as long as I use the semicolon, whatever statement the cursor is in will execute. So I'm just going to say control enter. I'm going to create that table. All right. Now I can insert into that table. And in the first example, I'm going to use a string literal. Right? Now these are textual values. But remember, the comma is the delimiter. It's going to interpret it as text because that's the column type. If I try and insert something other than text, maybe a, a multi, you know, something like a point or something like that, it would produce an error. Uh, probably try and convert it, uh, cast it first if it could and so forth. So I simply say insert into and I get my first value in that table. I can also do the array constructor as we said earlier. And again here, I have to do the quotes because of the data type. If I don't do the quotes, in this case the text, it will give me an error because it says documentary is not a column I know about. It's interpreting those things as columns in the array. And so I will insert that second row. And so what we have is two rows, and you'll see that the data type is, often pre is always presented in all tooling that I know about at least, that I've used, as the string literal version of that, or the literal version of that array. Okay, so you have the curly brackets and the values. All right, now, how can we refer to those? Again, I said we're one base, so I just use the column name, I use the square bracket, and I can pull out the first element of the array of each, the first element of each array uh, row by row. That's right? so all I'm doing here. Now in Postgres, if I refer to an element that does not exist, it doesn't throw an error, it simply provides null. I apologize, I forgot to set uh, dbeaver to return null for null, so that's my bad, and I apologize for that. Um, and it doesn't matter, it's not just because I said zero and it's zero base. Really, any number I put in here that 
if that row doesn't have six elements, it just doesn't produce a result, right? So it's not going to throw you an error in some way. So it's definitely, it's very dynamic as, as far as we go. Now, creating arrays. So now I'm uh, using arrays. So now I have an array of values. In this case, these two rows have three. Notice that I haven't specified the length of the array. In Postgres, uh, you can actually specify the length when you create that table. I want an array type that's only four values. It just ignores it. Uh, there's, it it's part of the SQL standard, uh, but it doesn't actually bound the array in any way. You could create something of uh, longer uh, distance, of longer uh, length. So I take that array, and I want to do something with it. So arrays by nature are unrelational. Right? It's a non-relational data type. I, they're not row by row, something I can link and join to something else, naturally. So often, we have arrays, we want to turn them into rows so that we can manipulate them with our other SQL functions, right? And so in Postgres, we do that with the function called unnest. So I'm just going to take the first. Remember, I have two rows. Each row has an array with three items. I'm just going to take the first row, and when I unnest that column, I get three rows. Right? It takes it, and it's, I call it a pivot, whatever you want to call it. It takes the array, turns it into rows. And then if you happen to join out of that, so I'm just selecting from this one table, I'm unnesting one of the columns, so it has to repeat it row by row. The other column is kind of going to act like a constant. It's just going to repeat that column over and over again. So this can be helpful if you have an array and you want to list out like, hey, this is... I'm not having a good example, a product, and here's all the colors that are associated with that product. You'll see the product over and over and over again with all the colors just to make sure you're looking at the right thing. That's what will happen when you do something like, uh, the, again, this kind of functions as a constant. Now, that's all great if you get arrays somehow into your table, but how do you create arrays from the data that you need? Maybe you want to do something with the array. You want to slice and dice them. You want to use it, manipulate it in some way. Uh, this is really helpful. We have lots of aggregation functions in Postgres, and Array Ag will do that for you. Whatever data type you are uh, selecting on, you can select columns, and it will create an, uh, an array of that data type. All right? And so in this case, I selected title. I have power to Postgres and Postgres to the SQL. It's an, it's an aggregation function, so it can, in this case, take an order by. Notice that Postgres to is second, because that was the second row, it just, it's just pulling them out of the row, but I can, oops, but I can order that out of the, do the order, and now Postgres 2 is first. And then finally, it can uh, use the filter. So if you don't know about Postgres filters on aggregation functions, that's a different talk, but they're super powerful, and you should look into it, because it's a really unique value, again, that Postgres brings to your queries. But this is saying, hey, as I work row by row, Apply this filter first. If this row matches this filter, yay or nay, then go ahead and do the aggregate on it. Uh, maybe I'll show you an example if I have time at the end, if I use this another way. All right, so we have uh, Postgres 2. So only one of them did that where clause, and I did an aggregation on it. I mean, just gets me one value, but imagine, again, I had many rows. You could do something like that. You could do this with a where clause as well, but the nice thing about the aggregates in general doing the filter here is it's doing it as the rows are reading in, and it provides an opportunity for some values that you wouldn't be able to do with a, a filter. Last couple things as far as working with arrays, you can slice and dice them. So again, you probably have seen this in other languages. You can refer to ranges within the array, and that will get you uh, the forward or the backwards, you know, inside of that array where the slice is. Now again, we are one base. So this is going to get me, and they're always in, in an array, it's always inclusive. So I'm going to get element one inclusive of element two. So I should get the first two values, which I do. Now I could do something silly, like uh, you know, one, one. The difference here is, when I do the bounds like this, you may notice, let me just do this really quickly, see if you notice the difference. It is the same thing as doing this, but now look at the difference here and see if you notice it. Anyone notice what happened? I got an array back out, right? So it still is an array, 
That might be useful for what you're doing. Maybe your procedure expects an array value, so if you don't do the range, it's going to throw you an error because now it's getting a text or something like that, a non-array value. Uh, so it can happen. And then again, like many other languages, uh, you can do uh, an unbounded to one side or the other. So in this case, we're saying since there is nothing on the left, start from the beginning up to element two, I could do it the other way. You know, one up to the end, which would be everything, or two up to the end, which would be. So in this case, I do that, and again, I'm getting number one, number two. And like I said, I could do it the other way, like that, and I would get two and three. Or two and whatever. I, again, both of these have three elements, but let's say one had three and one had ten, I would have two different lengths of array here, because I'm saying get me from two to the end, whatever that is. Now, you can also do dynamics. Uh, you can do this dynamically. Right? So maybe you don't know how long your, the length of your array is in this column, but you want to get everything uh, from the beginning until, uh, you know, from some value until the end. Or the, I guess in this case I'm doing a minus one, so it's everything but the last element. So I can do array length on the value that I'm pulling out and do it that way. All right, a couple more things, and we'll go back to how we can use some of this. You can update arrays. Right, so it's a data type, it's a data column, and you can do it in two ways. Again, if it's, if it's your column, you need to specify a literal array of some sort. Again, the constructor or the literal. So in this case, I'm saying, oh, that film ID number two, maybe you didn't realize it, I uh, accidentally put suspense in there rather than thriller, and maybe I want everything to be the same. And so I could just replace the entire thing, and when I look at that, it now says thriller instead of suspense. Or maybe I was wrong and I really did mean to say suspense for that second column, that second value in the array. If you know what the value is, uh, you, know, you know the ordinal position, you can simply say update that one position in that one um, thing. And now you see that says suspense. Now, there, there are many other functions I'm not showing you. You could iterate and you could actually search the array for the value to get the ordinal to go update it. Like there's lots of ways to go about it. I'm just trying to get you started, and you can go find more of these functions to see how complex you want to get. And then I think uh, we're soon to go back to the slides here. So this is the multidimensional array I was saying. And define it. In any, so I'm doing the constructor here. I could do a literal. So it would be quote, curly bracket, curly bracket, one, two, three, curly bracket, comma, curly bracket, four, five, six, curly bracket. You know, I could do the literal as well. I'm just doing it in the constructor. Oh, there it is. OK, what does output is what I meant to say. There you go. Um, and as I was saying, you cannot have this, um, different lengths of an array in a multidimensional array. That's just a, a limitation. It's been that way for a long time. I don't know if there's ever going to be a reason to update it or not. Again, for what I was using, wanted to use it for, like it kind of would have been cool if I could have, but I found another way, and that's OK, too. All right. Um, oops. That's not what I meant to do. OK, so sorry. I, uh, I didn't put a reminder in there for me. So uh, before I get to the pending, I do want to now say, so we've gone through all the take the array, turn it into rows, slice and dice, replace, search, find. And here's one of the things I want to make sure I call out really quickly. And this is in the documentation. Arrays are not sets. Right? A database, a relational database is designed best to work with sets of data that's relational, row by row, column by column, right? That's, that's just how the whole system's been designed. And so they can be really useful, and there are absolutely places where it makes sense to use it. And that's, it's great, totally fine. There's a lot of other features we're going to quickly talk about. But if you're using it in a relational way on a large database, a large table, you're probably going to run into performance problems. And it probably means you should be doing something else like a regular relational table in some way. OK? So there. That's out of the documentation. I've said it. My problem is when I find something fun, it becomes my hammer, and every problem in my database looks like the nail, right? And so I try and make an array out of everything, because I'm almost lying, but not quite. Um, or almost telling the truth. Anyway. So just recognize it can be pretty fun, um, but uh, just make sure that you know what you're doing. So let's go back. I was meant to do that warning uh, in a, uh, before I got to this part. So we can append them. So now I have different arrays. So you can change the array. You can add to it, right? And so I don't have to replace it. I can say, let's pull out the film type. 
And as long as we have this function, append array append, and as long as it is the same data type as the array that you're appending to, you'll be fine. If you don't, you'll get an error. It's not going to try and cast the value for you. Now, I could cast the value. Maybe you have this stored in a table. I could cast that to text, and then it's happy to do it. All right. Uh, you can also use the shorthand, but you can only use the shorthand if you use, again, a literal array. All right? It has to have the quote and the curly brackets. So if I do that, I can do the, uh, the uh, bar bar, why am I not, pipe, thank you, pipe pipe uh, is the append operator in Postgres, so you can do that. However, notice that I can't just do, even though it's text and text, that will not do a cast for me by default. All right? Array append will, it knows it's a text, it understands how to unwrap that, make it an array element and put it in. And then this is where it starts to get kind of cool, is you can actually then search arrays. So we have this, uh, I know that one of the elements in here is documentary. So this might look a little bit backwards. And when I, remember I told you about that situation where I learned we could do arrays and we had to search the array and I wanted to do things like, Array column equals, or array column like, and I was getting errors and it wasn't working. Um, and so the way this works is you say, hey, here's the element I want. Is it, contain, is, is it found in any of the elements in the array? So it seems backwards. We used to have the, the column name and the thing we're searching for on the other side of the predicate. In this case, you're saying this thing is equal to any element over there. Fortunately, it does. We get both values. I could search for position, right? Look in this element, does it contain documentary? We get the same two rows, all right? Uh, if I said element two, right, we, get no, we don't get any rows because element two, it doesn't exist. Same thing with suspense, right? So this one should only return one. Again, this value or this set of values is it contained in anything on the other side? There is also an all operator. So if all of the elements in the array equal this, return. Again, if you look at documentation. But then this is where it's kind of cool. If you have two, two arrays, you can start to compare the two together and decide a couple things. The and and operator on an array says, is there any overlap between the left-hand side and the right-hand side? So this gets a little bit more like I would expect to write when I'm writing SQL. In this column, this array, is there any overlap with this array element? Now notice, I have to make it an array because now I'm comparing array types. And I, sorry, I should have closed this so you can see. That's the one thing with doing that, so I get the, the same thing, okay? Now the other cool thing here is you, that we also have what's called the contains. So this is a little bit different. The array on the left, in this case, basically, whichever side has the at symbol is kind of like your template. And the one that's on the other side of the, of the, uh, the arrow is like you're searching, your, your, your overlay, as it were. Um, so we're saying, hey, for this column, we know that it has three arrays. Does it fully contain the array on the right? In this case, it does, right? It does contain, uh, and again, I'm hitting control enter. That's the only problem with using debugger in this case. And saying, yes, there's three elements in that one array. One of them is suspense, so it fully contains the other array. Sweet. If I reverse it, does suspense fully contain any array on the other side? No, it doesn't. All right? So this was cool. Remember I said, um, you know, I've written procedures before where I'm keeping track of an element and I'm building up an array of found elements. This is a really easy way to say, is this element contained, any, fully contained in this list that I'm building up? Sweet, okay, move on. I don't have to add it to the element. I don't have to add it to the array. Um, it can be indexed, some other stuff. You can do some other things like that. Um, and then notice, again, the order doesn't matter. So that suspense one, let me go find it again for you, just so you can see. Notice that the order of the array does not matter here. So it's in, on the database, it's documentary suspense action. 
I created an array element that has all of them in a different order. It's simply looking to see, do any of them, does it fully contain all of them? I just hit Control Enter, it still returns it back, okay? And then last but not least, uh, yes, last but not least, this is probably one of the most coolest things, that's not great English, um, this is one of the great things about indexes, uh, about arrays is they can be indexed in Postgres. So we have a gin type index, and it will actually create an index of the elements within the array, which then make it searchable, um, and it would use the index itself. Otherwise, it would have to always do a seek scan. It, 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 there's no other way to probe into that without reading every row and running one of these functions. But now if I'm trying to find a function in an array and there's a, an index on it, it could use it if necessary. So we'll create this index. This is a simple version of it. A couple of the things you could do, there are a couple different kinds of GIN uh, operators you might be able to use with it. A lot of the uh, functionality that we get in things like PostGIS and others use GIN indexes for doing, it's basically an inverse index, and it's an easy way to say this one element is found in many different rows um, inside of any of these positions. So kind of cool. So the only way for me to show you this, so let me just do this first. If I query for suspense, I run that same thing, and I explain analyze, you'll notice that it first does a seek scan, all right? Sorry, I love my little pointer. Woo! It does a seek scan. All right, but it's because there are only two rows, right? If you don't know this, Postgres almost always tends towards seek scans. Uh, there's a, like a pretty low threshold. And the reason is, as a heap-based table, um, if, it if it feels like it's going to have to go read a lot of pages anyway, it's not going to save that much more effort than trying to go find the random pages you need. It's like, you know what, let me just get it all and then I'll do what I need to do with it. Now, there's all kinds of nuances there. There's a lot of cool query tuning you can do. But in order to kind of say, hey, to show you this example that it can use that index, I can encourage Postgres not to do a seek scan and see if there is an array will it use it. And sure enough, now it does this bitmap index scan right there, all right? And so now that it has a bitmap index scan, so that's a really fun way to actually use your um, arrays. So in that example I gave you earlier, we had not that many, but let's say we had a couple thousand clients, and we had all these SSO agents set up. We could have had arrays with many different domains, create an index, and it would only go find the, page, the pages it needed to return the value for what we needed from it. So it saves a lot of processing power that we can dig into these arrays. Any questions there? All right. All right, Ryan, well, that's cool. So what? Well, this has become most useful for me as I've been sometimes playing with things like Advent of Code and sometimes doing real work every once in a while um, in things that I've gotten more used to using Postgres because of some of these powers for what we would call ELT. For the last 20, 30 years, right, or maybe last 20-ish years, the big thing in the world has been ETL. I have a bunch of data sets. We're going to extract the data. We're going to transform it externally and then insert the transformed relational data into a database that I can now query and do something with. Number one, that can be a lot of process. <laughs> uh, you often have a whole other job duty for it. You have to usually buy tooling. You might have various kinds of tooling. And I've come to realize and find through some really generous people that have helped to teach me more and more about how to do this in Postgres, Postgres has a lot of tools inside of it to help you do this work. And so we change that slightly to extract, load it into the database, and then transform it to what you need. One of the best reasons I've found for doing this is not even specifically what I'm going to show you in a minute, but even something like JSON. There's been a lot of discussion over the last maybe two, three years is Postgres the new SQL, no SQL combination database, right? I have a relational table, but I can store my JSON blobs in there, and then I can just still query them out with a key or something. Because we have JSON indexes and JSONB and all kinds of cool stuff like that. And the answer is, yeah, maybe. But what I've tended to do, so going back to the Wordle example, I ingested for about three weeks, I ingested a couple million Wordle tweets, and I just, I extracted you know, I wrote this, it was maybe a 50-line Python script, and I extracted the stuff I knew I needed, 
but then I stored the JSON because, well, I don't know if I'm going to need that column, but maybe I'll eventually figure out it would be great if that was a relational column, and I could just extract it and change my table, right? So it became a really interesting way to reuse this data. So to me, that's extract, load it, and then transform it on the fly as I need it. Maybe that transformation creates a table, or maybe it doesn't. I'm using it in a process somewhere. So that's why this stuff is cool to me and why I want to teach you a little bit about um, what we're doing. And so ELT and Postgres is, again, I just think it's super powerful. I'm showing you arrays because I think they're fun and there's been some cool things I've found to do with them. A lot of this could be said for JSON as well. There are tons of JSON functions. In fact, some of the puzzles that I solved for ad advent of code, I used arrays. Other people use JSON because you can dynamically modify the JSON under the covers. One thing that JSON's better about than um, arrays is, again, array, I can't do the multi, uh, a multi-dimensional array with different lengths. Well, if it's JSON, I could have a key with whatever string of stuff I want in there. And so that would have been a, a better way to go about that solution, maybe. And the cool thing is a lot of these functions I'm going to show you now um, use arrays as the input or the output. So that was my idea. And so let's go look at pattern matching. Oh, so yeah, so here's the pattern matching. I'm going to quickly show you uh, how to use some of these. These are a lot of the functions that I use to take data, raw data, textual often, and transform into something that I can use when it comes to arrays. So we have uh, regex functions. There are three of them. Split to array, match, matches. And then there's a string to array. And you'll see in just a second what the difference is in all of those. The coolest part of this is, and this is where the power comes in, as you'll see, we're getting near the end here, uh, is I can use these with cross-join lateral. So who knows what a cross-join is? OK, so cross-join says when I take two tables, when I cross-join them, I go row by row from table one. So table one, spit it out, and I iterate over every row in table two. Then I go to row two, and I iterate every row in table two. So it's a, mul it's a multiplicative uh, join, right? You're going to get total rows times total rows. When I do a lateral, and by default, uh, Postgres treats a cross-join essentially as a lateral, Lateral means whatever, as I iterate row by row from this table, I can reference values from this table in the other table or the other query that I'm running. So I lateral into a different query. I can now reference things back here. Cool. You can do that with functions. And that's where some of the power really comes out. And then the last thing, which you'll see in just a second, is any of those things, if I do this with a function and it's a set returning function, I can do this thing called with ordinality. And that will show me the order in which the values came out of that function. It saves you doing a row number, for instance, and it maintains the order. Sometimes you might do a query. You're not guaranteed that what you see is actually the order that they came out of that function. So that can be really, really powerful. All right, so let's keep going. Pattern matching, so we have string to array. So again, I'm just going to take this. What this says is, uh, this is very literal. This one character set, whatever that character set is. In this first example, I have a space, right? So take the string, split it on a space, and give me an array of all the elements that were split. So power to Postgres, PostgresQL to colon the SQL, all right? Now, I can do it based on any character set. I could do other things, but it's just a, it's a literal string. I can't do regex or anything here. So in this case, what you'll notice is the first value, this is another nuance of these functions. Just because there wasn't a colon in here doesn't mean it didn't do something. It said, well, there was none. I'll just return the whole string to you as a one element array. The second one gives you two elements because it split it and notice the colon is gone, right? It's what you'd probably expect from any language when you do a split. Now, I can't, sometimes I've wanted, to, on the fly, I've wanted to do this. I said, well, hey, that function's going to return an array. Can't I just reference the first element from it? Well, you can't in this form. It is a set returning function, but only if it's used as a set value after the from. So in this case, if I wanted to, re, if I wanted to get the first element out of that array, I would have to essentially do a cross join. So select from film cross-join to this function, which can reference a column from film, right? So I have uh, film, t 
title is a, uh, is a column in there, do my split, and then that gets me a value P, which I can reference as one. So now I can get the first element that way. All right. Again, notice the first title had no colon, so it's the entire string. That's just what you're going to get back. All right. Now, in, uh, for all the rest of the examples you'll see from me, and you'll see this often online, notice that I've simply replaced the cross join right there with a comma. Right, so when you, in any SQL, that's just SQL standard, a comma between sets is a cross join, and uh, Postgres interprets this as a cross join lateral, so I can reference backwards. And so I get the exact same result, I just hit Control Enter, because it, is, it means the exact same thing, right? It's a lot simpler to write it that way. So what's the difference between regex split to array? So now I can do actual regex, right? So this is uh, slash s is space, one or more, because I put a plus, and it's just doing the exact same thing. But you could come up with other regular expressions to get how you want to split a string apart. Really cool. Now I get arrays. I can use that array in other ways to reference the slice and dice and do something with. Now I could do something else. So because it's regex match, this will also give me a set of arrays. But this is, a, if you don't know what this is, this is called a capturing group the parentheses there. So this says, hey, if you find a match for this, any, so this says any characters up to a colon, I didn't put starts with, but I could have, right? Any regular expression, POSIX regular expression, that group is what will be spit out as the array. Now regex match only spits the first value out, all right? Um, regex and I could uh, go, so that's the first value. See that the first one got null. Um, now the problem is it got null. I could do a lot more to get rid of that null. Now again, what I'm doing here is simply doing a regex match. Again, I'm doing that cross join. I could have just said where and searched the string. Yes, I could have, that would have been easier. But if you have some values coming out and raised in some way, you can treat it as a table and do searching in that way. All right, last couple things I wanna show you. One example with Wordle and then we'll conclude. So I want to leave time for a question or two. Um, just look at my time. All right, so now, uh, the width ordinality. So I can take, uh, in this case again, I have that film type, and we showed this earlier. Remember I split them out and you got rows? I can keep track of the order that they came out. So in this case I have the title, the value of the film type, and the order in which they were in the um, inside of the array. So with ordinality is this a nice feature of Postgres that was added a number of years ago, and it's a performance enhancement because I don't have to use a window function. A window function, if I were to, I could do this with a window function, but a window function row number has to iterate over the entire set again. So if this is a really large set, you could increase by at least 2x getting the row number out where this just does it for you. Um, I will do, I'm going to skip over these because I, I want to get to the, the fun stuff here. So how does this, how did this help me solve something else? So we've done a lot, right? We have, how do we create arrays? How do we store arrays? How do we reference arrays? How do we use some of these functions to take things like strings, break them into other parts, right? So I had this Wordle. This is an actual Wordle capture. Those are actual emojis. They just, on Windows, don't show up as green, yellow, and black. This is how they show up in dBeaver. On Mac, in DB, really show up the emojis. Anyway, if you don't know the double dollar sign syntax, that just simply is a, a concatenate. It basically says everything inside of here is a literal string. It just makes it easier for me to reference this. Uh, so when I do it, that's pretend that this is a row in a table. That's why I'm using it this way. So just pretend this is a row. That's all that's for. So in this case, I can say regex match. The first thing I need to do is break apart the guesses. So in Wordle, every row is a guess, all right? So I need to get row by row. So I say matches, which will spit out every match it finds, as many as there are. I have this cool little regex. It says, if you find any one of these emojis up to five times in a row, that's a match, spit it out. So now I get that, and I did with ordinality. So I know that this is guess one, Guess two, guess three, cool. But now I needed to figure out the letters inside. So now I can take those rows, that is a set, it's a, it's a row, it's something I'm pulling, so now I can take that set, sorry, I, just, I made this a little bit nicer with the CTE, 
I can take that set and I can split it out further. Now I say, from this set, take uh, element one. There's only one element, but I have to reference it to get it out as a textual, uh, a textual thing. So reference element one, split it out further. If you find one value, spit that out. And then I'm going to concatenate these two with a cross join. So now it's going to get a little bit longer. All right, got to speed up here. Almost done. And so you can see that I have both the guess and then every letter within that guess and the order in which the guesses came out. And I'll keep going uh, really quickly. Uh, what I was eventually getting to is I could turn this into a table that I could then query. So I basically said, now that I have all of them, uh, you know, add up through filtering how many correct guesses. So in the first guess, there were no correct letters, two partially correct, they would have been the yellow ones, and then three incorrect, the black ones. Pretty cool, right? All right, that was fun. So there's a lot of ways you can start combining all these things into uh, taking things that you have into values. The last thing I was just going to show you is, um, and I do have, I, I will show you one other thing if you want to look at how I use some of this for, um, for advent of code, because that's really where it gets kind of fun. Um, but inserting rows with arrays. So I have another talk about bulk inserts. You can probably find it a couple places online. Uh, I have the slides for that up where I showed you earlier as well. One of the little tricks you can actually do is use arrays to insert values into a database. Now, why would you do this? Well, the reason it was discovered by some folks is a lot of the frameworks that we use, uh, there's this parameterization limit of an int, a small int, 65,000, 65, yeah, 65,000 some odd parameters. So when you do something in your, uh, in your language of choice, and you say insert into, and then you insert 100,000 rows, most likely that tool is parameterizing it. It's, it literally does insert into parentheses, question mark, question mark, question mark, parentheses, question It just does that. Well, you can only have 65,000 of those question marks. So that's the limitation. Postgres doesn't know how to uh, combine more than that, that number. And so I could send in 100,000 rows of data with many columns, and I'm only getting one question mark per array, right? So I could have 100,000 uh, you know, maybe a, a three-table, uh, three-column table, 100,000 values per column, and then if I unnest it during my select, we're, we're fine and happy. Go used to have a problem, that's how we found this, right? We couldn't bind more than 65,000. We turned that into a send the elements as an array. It sent one insert statement. The server unnested everything and inserted the rows for us. In some cases, this is actually faster. And so here's an example of doing that. I'm just going to insert two more rows into that table. I have an array of three and four, an array of two more titles. And I simply say insert, and I do the unnest. And now I have two more rows in there. So again, I have a different talk. You can see how you, it actually, I think I insert maybe a million rows in a couple seconds doing this. Uh, and it, in some circumstances, even internally, it can be pretty fast. So, uh, I will give you one bonus at the end. Let me just complete this and see if there's any questions. Conclusion, arrays are one of the unique and powerful data types of Postgres. I think uh, everyone should figure out how to use them, what some of these uh, toolings are. Learning how to use them will really help you and learn how to manipulate it can really be one of your powerful tool sets to transforming data to bring, so you can get value out of it. You can actually do queries over that data. And honestly, I just think they're super fun. So let me just give you one quick example uh, to finish this off in, uh, which one of these did I want to show you? No, not that one. Uh, not that one, oh, that's cool. So here's my favorite one. Is that it? Yes, this is my favorite one. So this is the, uh, this is the data for, this is December 10th in Advent of Code. Right, so it's, it's a way basically to get a display. Taking this data, it's a whole bunch of commands it's supposed to represent an LED screen and when to flash on a, a pixel or not in the screen. As you go through here, again, I have uh, videos that I walk through all this online. I can give you that in a second. Um, lots of things in here. I'm doing all kinds of array looking. I'm splitting stuff out. And the final value was to basically uh, do this thing where you would take it, and there's all my values, my sprites, adding, subtracting, creating arrays. And it was to get this thing where you would get letters out, and that was the answer to the puzzle. So pretty cool. 
I really enjoyed that. And it was just really fun to do it with arrays, right? By taking that one textual thing, transforming it into something I could eventually select and manipulate. Super fun. That is it. If you have questions, we have one or two minutes for questions. This will, for you who weren't here earlier, this will go up later tonight. I mostly just want to make sure I got through it. If I need to make any changes, that's why I don't post. This is the first time I've given the talk in full. So once it's done, it will be up there. If you go to YouTube, at Ryan Booz, you can watch me keep bees, and you can watch some of my admin code videos uh, walking through each of the days. Up to day 10, I'll eventually get around to the others uh, soon. Thank you so much. I hope that was helpful.